You know, we take walking for granted, but the reality is that it's a difficult act of controlled falling. Your heel strikes the floor, you actuate your foot to the flat position, and then roll the toes. All the while, your brain is processing information about how much traction your feet have, how much pressure you're applying, and what angle your foot is at, among many, many other things. Screw up one little move, and down you go with a pride-obliterating faceplant. It's not really surprising that teaching robots to walk is a pretty hard problem to solve. Undaunted by difficult tasks, robotics researchers have been at it for years. In 2017, DARPA hosted a competition for people to show off their bipedal robots, and the results were, well, let's just say it's good for a laugh. The bots were given a variety of services and tasks to attempt to navigate, and as you can see, the results look like a blooper reel. To be fair, Boston Dynamics has had quite a bit of success in recent years. In 2020, they tried to cheer up a weary world with a robotic dance routine performed by Atlas, their bipedal robot, and his friends. The result is pretty impressive and goes to show the rapid advancements in modern robotics. The routine was a single take with no edits. Now, I don't think we'll be seeing Atlas on Dancing with the Stars anytime soon, but it is an impressive first attempt. It's worth noting that none of these robots, meaning Atlas and his friends, are using machine learning or really any sort of artificial intelligence to learn their maneuvers. In fact, none of the commercially successful implementations of bipedal robots are using AI, at least as far as I am aware. They're all using model-based methods, which is fancy speak for solving a bunch of differential equations pertaining to the physics of the system. Now allow me to grossly oversimplify here. The software is programmed to the physics of the motors, stuff like the friction in the joints or how much play there is in the gears, as well as the physics of the world. These equations are solved at each time step to figure out how much torque to apply to the motors to generate a sustainable gait. Despite the fact that researchers are using peasant class technology, the performance is both impressive, entertaining, and a little bit scary if you extrapolate some of the applications of this technology. Recently, a team at Berkeley decided they were tired of using peasant tech and applied reinforcement learning to teaching a robot how to walk. They've detailed their work in the paper titled Reinforcement Learning for Robust Parameterized Locomotion Control of Bipedal Robots. They use an off-the-shelf robot called Cassie, manufactured by Agility Robotics. Now, before you rush out to hand them your quarter million dollars, you should know that it's discontinued and you can't get one brand new. Sadly, this means I'm unable to produce their results. Though in reality, it's not like I have a spare quarter million laying around, and even if I did, I still couldn't get one. Nonetheless, we can read the paper and see what sort of insights we can glean. The basic idea behind their approach is that they're going to use reinforcement learning, specifically proximal policy optimization, to imitate gates, meaning a pattern of bipedal movement, from a reference library. They'll use training in environments with randomized parameters to simulate uncertainty in the real world. After training, they test in a high fidelity simulator before deploying the policy in the real CASI robot. This approach is pretty novel, as prior RL-based approaches have relied on using it to generate small corrections to reference motions generated by the models we talked about earlier. While this does technically work, it's not very robust. As soon as the robot has to deviate too far from that reference motion, it can quickly become unstable. The result of using their new approach is that the robot can recover from perturbations, like poking at it with a stick, and return to a stable gait. Even more serious problems, like a failing motor, can be fixed on the fly without additional training. It can also handle transitions from one type of terrain to another, meaning services with different coefficients of friction, without getting tripped up. Another cool consequence of their training is that the learned policies can generate gates with parameters outside of the reference library, which means the robot can exhibit a pretty wide diversity of motions. A detailed schematic of their new approach is given here in Figure 2 from the paper. We see that there's some gate library, a desired turning yaw velocity, and observations of several previous time steps that get fed into the agent's policy, generated using PPO. The output is a series of currents to be applied to the Cassie's motors, which are fed through a low-pass filter into a joint-level PD controller before being directly applied to the robot. The actual motor positions the robot achieves are what constitutes the observations that are then fed back into the policy to generate the next set of currents.
To really appreciate the beauty of this approach, we need to take a look at the prior work that has been done in robotic bipedal motion. As we talked about earlier, more traditional approaches to bipedal motion relied on simplified models of the dynamics. These worked pretty well for flat-footed robots, but the motion wasn't very impressive. One such technique is something called hybrid zero dynamics, or HZD for short. It's centered on producing more realistic motion on robots with articulated feet, and so was a pretty significant step forward for the field. It forms the basis for the reference gate library the authors use as input for their PPO policy. Certainly, the present work isn't the first attempt at applying reinforcement learning to robotic motion. Arles had some success in multi-legged and low-dimensional bipedal robots. In this case, low-dimensional means low degrees of freedom or not very many joints to articulate. The more joints, the more complex the dynamics, and the more ways for the robot to fall over. And just to be clear, by joints, I don't mean smoke two joints before you smoke two joints. I mean joints as in hinges for articulating movement. These past attempts relied on using RL to make small corrections to model-based methods for a reference trajectory. This limits the diversity of behaviors because the resulting policies never stray too far from their model-based foundations and doesn't allow the robot to change the walking height and turning yaw on the fly. This really reduces the mobility of the robot in tight quarters and also the limits the diversity of the types of walking the robot can do. The end result is that the prior RL approaches didn't really improve on the model-based methods in any really substantive way. Of course, the authors intend to change all of that with their new approach. Obviously, a big part of that is going to be training and simulations and then transferring the learned policies to the real world. It's not surprising, but simulations are exactly that. They can't capture the exact dynamics of the real world. If some part of the floor wasn't buffed as much as another, then that's a problem that's hard to simulate. The present work uses domain randomization, meaning simulating in environments with a variety of parameters, to handle uncertainty in the real world. Speaking of simulations, let's talk a little bit about the mathematics underlying their new approach. The system state vector is characterized by a set of 20 numbers and is denoted by Q sub m. These include 10 rotational joints, 4 passive joints, 3 transitional degrees of freedom, and 3 rotational degrees of freedom. Our observable state vector, denoted by Q super O, is almost the same, but it does away with the three transitional degrees of freedom because those are hard to measure without some sort of external instrumentation. To be clear, the difference is this. The robot has some idea of how far each step takes it, and it knows how many steps it has taken. It therefore knows how far it has gone on its own reference frame, but doesn't know where it is in the absolute reference frame. That's why we do away with the three translational degrees of freedom in the observation vector. The authors parameterize the input to the system using something called a gate parameter, denoted by P, that defines the desired gate. Now, if you're not familiar with this term gate, it's just a set of periodic joint trajectories that make the biped move. Periodic in this case means a couple things. First, that joints are going to have some starting position that they're going to be in as they take a step, and that they're going to return to that position when they complete the step. It's also periodic in the sense that the robot is going to keep moving. It's not going to just take a single step and stop. To characterize the gate, they use forward velocity, lateral velocity, and walking height. This latter is especially important in case the robot needs to do the mambo at a beach party. All kidding aside, a gate could be a casual stroll down the sidewalk, a so-called power walk, or an outright jog. It could mean moving forward while rotating your hip to get through a narrow gap, or moving forward while ducking to get through a short passageway, or any combination or permutation of the above, and more. The collection of gates is called the gate library, and they use a technique called hybrid zero dynamics to construct it. Next we come to the training portion of the paper and the nitty gritty details of their RL implementation. In each time step, Cassie observes a state S and goal G and outputs the policy pi. The agent samples the policy and executes an action, causing a transition to a new state and the collection of a reward. They use Mujoko as a simulator, pretty much a common choice for this task. Their action space is a 10-dimensional vector that specifies the positions for each of the 10 motors. It's passed through a low-pass filter and a PD controller to generate torques for each motor. The state space is a little more interesting. It's comprised of two components, the first of which is the observable robot state at the current time step as well as the previous four steps. Now remember that the observable state means the positions and velocities of the 10 motors, four passive joints, and the three rotational degrees of freedom for the robot. 
The second component is the set of four previous actions the agent undertook at the past four time steps. The reason the last four time steps are incorporated is that the agent doesn't have a model of the world. This is, after all, model-free learning. Giving it data on how the system evolves at each time step allows it to build a model for the environment's dynamics. The problem of getting the robot to emulate a reference gate is handled by the introduction of a goal function. The user inputs some command to the robot, called C, which is a function of the desired gate parameter from the HZD library, as well as turning yaw velocity. This desired gate parameter is used to generate the reference gate. They then compute the reference gate at future time steps and feed that time series, along with the user command, to the robot. No reinforcement learning problem would be complete without a reward system, and if you've been paying attention to my channel for a while now, you know that good reward design is a critical part of the RL problem. Their solution is to tie in the rewards to the differences between the true motor positions and the reference motor positions. The reward is a dot product between two seven-component vectors. One vector is comprised of some discounting parameters, and the other is a sequence of terms where some are proportional to the exponential differences between the actual motor positions and the desired ones. The other terms are proportional to the exponential of the torque applied by the motors, as well as to the vertical contact forces between the foot and the ground. Now on the surface, this seems like a solid design choice. It doesn't overspecify, but it does encourage the desired behavior, which is mimicry of some calculated gate parameters. Something they note here is that the gate library doesn't include the turning yaw parameter, so the researchers are actually introducing some more diversity of behavior here by supplying it in the user command. As we talked about earlier, the authors deal with sim to real world transfer by introducing some domain randomization to the problem. What they do is to introduce some random uncertainty to some key parameters in the environment. They randomize link masses, meaning the weights of the various parts of the robot, along with joint damping, ground friction, and noise in the robotic sensors, and communication delays between the robot and controller. As for the reinforcement learning portion, the learning model they use should be pretty familiar to regular viewers here. They're using PPO with a neural net comprised of two hidden layers with 512 neurons and 10 hyperbolic activation functions for both the policy and value functions. They input the observed state and goal to the policy, along with the added noise for the domain randomization. The policy outputs a 10-dimensional vector that is a Gaussian action distribution that they then sample for the actual motor positions for the robot. The value network does its thing by outputting the expected return for the given state and goal given the agent's policy. Again, the value function gets the randomized parameters as input to help it deal with uncertainty in the real world. Then they go on to detail their training setup. What's most interesting is that every 8 seconds the robot gets a new command that's actually generated at random, or so it would seem based on my reading of the paper. The first command is also generated with zero yaw velocity and at random, meaning the robot isn't turning at the start. If you compare the range of commands they give in this paragraph to the parameters supplied by the gate library, you'll see that they're actually supplying commands that are outside of the known gates. This gives the robot a greater diversity of behaviors than what it would achieve just by following that library. Other things to note are that an episode lasts 83 seconds or when the robot topples over, whichever occurs first. Another interesting choice they made is that they don't introduce domain randomization all at once. They do it slowly using something called a curriculum. The reason is that if they adopt the full range of domain parameters from the start, the agent learns a curious policy. It just stands still. Now this is obviously the most stable configuration and thus makes it most likely the agent won't fall over, thus maximizing its reward. While this is a great solution, it's not what they want. The solution is to start out with a narrow range of domain parameters and gradually expand it over time so the robot learns a basic policy that it can later build on to more diverse environmental conditions. The way all this is done is pretty straightforward. They start out just in software using Bujoko as their environment. They test their model in a better simulator called Sim Mechanics, which is a MATLAB product. This is really slow, so they mostly use it for testing purposes. And if everything looks good, they deploy it on the real robot. Training results are shown in Figure 3, where they compare their non-curriculum versus curriculum approach, as well as the relative performance of their new method versus the prior RL implementation known as residual control. Just to refresh your memory, residual control means that reinforcement learning was used just to make small tweaks to a library of gates, rather than to use those gates as a basis for totally new behaviors.
In 3a, we can see that the green curve, which corresponds to full domain randomization at the start, exhibits some evidence of learning, but the results are pretty lackluster. The use of a curriculum for domain randomization gives a much higher overall return, as well as a much faster convergence time. It's worth noting that you get some oscillations in performance, which the authors don't address directly because they're a common feature of actor critic and policy gradient methods in general. In 3b, we see that the new method is comparable to the previous state-of-the-art residual control. It's important to keep in mind that this is purely in simulation and doesn't deal with real-world adversity, such as someone pushing on the robot or the robot having a failed motor. The big advancement in robustness with respect to perturbations is detailed next. Now, to understand this idea of robustness, we need two additional concepts, feasible and safe command sets. A feasible command set just means the robot won't flop over and break something. A safe command set means that the robot can actually demonstrate a stable gait. These are determined by sending some gait parameter P super D to the robot. If it can walk for 15 seconds without falling, then the actual gait parameter achieved P hat is added to the safe set. The physical interpretations of these sets are pretty easy to understand. A large feasible set means that the controller can handle a wide variety of scenarios. A large safe set means the robot can exhibit more dynamic motion since it can safely walk over a broad range of input parameters. Keep in mind that all of this is going on in the high fidelity simulator. The results for the testing are shown in figure 4. On the left we have the feasible command set as a function of the x velocity, meaning forward and reverse directions, and pelvic height of the robot. This is the feasible command set comparison between the RL approach in yellow and hybrid zero dynamics in blue. The RL approach spans a much broader region of parameter space, at least with respect to the x velocity, relative to the HZD. This means that the reinforcement learning enables the robot to cover a larger variety of situations than the HZD approach. Looking at the right panel, we see the safe set as a function of actual gate parameters achieved, again for the pelvic height and x velocity. Interestingly, it looks like the RL approach isn't quite as robust as the HZD with respect to the walking height. However, there is a caveat here. The HZD controller can't reliably track positions lower than 0.7 meters, while the RL controller can actually go down to 0.65 meters. Evidently, tracking error also plays a role in the X velocity, so the same caveat applies. With the HZD controller, the robot can be given a command of 2 meters per second and only achieve 1 meter per second. The RL approach manages a velocity of 1.2 meters per second, which obviously isn't perfect, but is actually pretty impressive given that the reference gait only goes up to 1 meter per second. So it's able to get closer to this applied command while operating well outside the bounds of what it has been trained to imitate. So these results are pretty impressive in simulation. How about real world performance? One impressive tidbit is that the robot actually experienced a malfunction that partially damaged two motors. This caused a left-right torque imbalance, an imbalance the HZD controller was unable to overcome. The result was that the robot could lower its pelvis, but then couldn't get back up. Remarkably, the RL approach handled it with grace the first time it was deployed. Another clear demonstration of robustness in the real world is their experiment with prodding the robot with a rod and placing an unknown load on the pelvis of the robot. In both cases, the robot is able to stay upright and maintain a stable gait. They also have a plot comparing their technique with a couple others when they apply a perturbation of a random force for a random duration. In all cases, the new technique is the best by varying margins. The results widen as the perturbation strength is increased. This means the robot is going to be able to handle getting bumped by humans or other robots much better than the more traditional controller or residual controlled methods. So that basically wraps up the paper. The too long didn't read is that the authors implemented a proximal policy optimization algorithm to produce a robust policy for the robot. It was trained in a Mujoko simulator with domain randomization and inputs that were designed to get the policy to mimic a reference gate library. The end result is a robot that can execute gates beyond the reference library and in the presence of external perturbations as well as motor failures and malicious actors whacking it with a stick. I'm pretty excited to see where future research goes with this robot. Bipedal motion is an exceptionally difficult problem, and the success of reinforcement learning in this domain makes me all the more hopeful that RL can play a role in more advances in AI in the future. To what end these advancements will be used is a valid question, but we can only hope it's to bring about an AI-enabled utopia rather than a Skynet-type nightmare.